Many of us have experienced food poisoning at one time or another, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, and sometimes fever. We get food poisoning, also called a foodborne illness, by eating something that's been contaminated with microbes. That is, as you remember, bacteria, viruses, or parasites. The animal that was slaughtered might have been infected. The fruit or vegetable that was harvested right next to a cow pen might have been contaminated by filthy water or other unsanitary farming conditions. We might have consumed the meat, poultry, fish, or seafood raw or undercooked, increasing our risk of infection. Or someone might have neglected proper food handling procedures, such as hand washing, refrigeration, and observance of expiration dates on perishable foods. And despite what we've heard about the nutritional benefits of adding fish to our diets, there are certain risks. You see, beyond the threat of microbes, fish are vulnerable to additional sources of contamination. As the GE story warned, fish can be contaminated by PCBs dumped into rivers. They're also susceptible to contamination by pesticides from stormwater runoff into rivers and to mercury. To avoid the effects of mercury poisoning, pregnant women and children are advised not to eat swordfish, shark, or mackerel, and to limit tuna to six ounces a week. As you can see, there are many hazards from farm or river to fork. The challenge is how to eliminate or reduce these multiple food hazards. Although in the privacy of our own homes, government can only advise not control what we eat and how we prepare it, federal agencies do have national oversight and regulatory control over all aspects of food production and distribution. Federal agencies assist state and local governments in the regulation of all wholesale and retail stores that sell food and all restaurants, fast food establishments, schools, and nursing homes that prepare and serve it. Local health departments enforce the rules by making periodic inspections of these facilities. To prevent foodborne illness, local health departments are authorized by law to issue warnings and even close facilities that are in significant violation. Sometimes prevention efforts don't work and a foodborne outbreak occurs. Prompt follow-up in the form of epidemiologic surveillance is necessary to find the source and halt the spread of disease. <clears throat> we'll learn more about epidemiologic surveillance in the next lecture. To interrupt an outbreak, which may be happening in several locations at once, the National PulseNet program has designated laboratories in all 50 states and in Canada to do simultaneous comparisons of pathogens that may be the cause of an outbreak. Confirmation of a common pathogen source enables public health officials to stop distribution of the contaminated food. In 2008, PulseNet made the national news for its role in epidemiologic surveillance. Staff noticed an unusual strain of salmonella reported in 12 states. After interviewing patients, they suspected that the salmonella was associated with the consumption of peanut butter. If you're like me, you're surprised that a food like peanut butter could be tainted. Investigating further, PulseNet staff found that all of the sickened patients had eaten at institutional settings such as nursing homes and schools. Within two months, staff had traced the problem to a Georgia company, which also supplied the product to producers of other peanut butter containing foods. A national recall of both peanut butter and peanut butter containing products followed and the Georgia company, which was in gross violation of food safety standards, was closed down for good. As you can imagine, a strictly inspection-based system could lead to a blame and shame atmosphere. <clears throat> so instead of just sending out food inspectors, or sanitarians as they're called, to do police work and look for food code violations, the federal government is trying to nurture a more cooperative relationship with the food industry. The federal government is encouraging food businesses to police and manage themselves and is holding them accountable for the results. First, businesses are advised to analyze every step in the process of food production, processing, and preparation. 
The government then makes them responsible for identifying possible problem points along the way, then devising procedures to prevent or minimize the problems they've found. The system is working. But one more problem is that our food supply is not just national, it's global. In fact, 80% of the seafood Americans consume is imported from other countries. Therefore, importers need to make agreements with foreign trading partners that they will maintain food safety systems comparable to our own. Foreign food companies, too, need to prioritize food safety. A big problem with the U.S. food safety system is the inefficient way in which it's regulated. A variety of federal, state, and local agencies are involved, and the laws that guide them require much more streamlining and coordination. Let's look at just the Food and Drug Administration and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the two federal agencies primarily responsible for ensuring national food safety. Laws governing them are highly inconsistent. The USDA is responsible for meat, poultry, eggs, and prepared products like pizza, which have even a small amount of cooked meat or poultry. The FDA is responsible for all other foods, that is, 80% of all federally regulated foods, including fish, seafood, produce, and prepared pizza, which contains only a cheese topping. While the FDA's role in food safety is much greater, its budget is only two-thirds of the budget allocated to the USDA. Furthermore, the FDA is responsible for the safety of all drugs, prescription and non-prescription. The FDA doesn't itself test drugs. The FDA just approves them. Drug or pharmaceutical companies file applications with the FDA for permission to conduct various phases of testing, beginning with animals and ending with controlled human trials in which patients are assigned randomly to two groups an experimental group that receives the new drug, and a control group that gets only a placebo or the standard treatment that's in use at the time. Once the companies submit their scientific evidence of safety, the FDA decides whether the drug goes to market. The FDA has been criticized for both being too slow and too fast in approving new drugs. The pharmaceutical industry charges that the FDA is too slow. It's taking drug companies too long to recoup their big investments in research and development. Desperate patients with life-threatening illnesses also claim that the FDA is too slow. New drugs might extend their lives. Pressure from AIDS patients led Congress to speed up the process by charging drug companies application fees. The FDA was able to hire more reviewers and hasten the process. On the other side, consumer advocates claim the FDA is too fast to approve new drugs. They point to several drugs which were recalled after they went to market, because only then were they found to have adverse effects. The diet drug Fenfen and the painkiller Vioxx are just two examples. Several recommendations have been made. First, the FDA should improve its monitoring of the drugs after they've gone to market. Second, the drug companies should do follow-up clinical trials to investigate what went wrong. Third, the drug companies should clearly label that safety information is incomplete if it is. And fourth, direct-to-consumer advertising should not be allowed for two years until the drug's safety has been proven. On all levels of the social-ecological model, we need to act now to protect our environment because our environment sustains us. At the policy level alone, we need to constantly review and update laws. We need to weigh scientific evidence on the risks and benefits of change versus continuing to do as we always do. We must encourage cooperation among government agencies at all levels, business and industry, and political stakeholders here and abroad. And when we the public must insist on being educated on health hazards as well as healthy choices so that we can do our share in this collaborative and ongoing battle for the environment.